Okay, I can see myself. Excellent. Everything seems to be working. So hello, anyone that is watching. Um, I fiddled around with a couple of settings on the computer related to audio volume and other things. So if you can't hear me, please let me know uh, and I will adjust things. All right. So I was trying to figure out what I should do with you guys today. Um, uh, there's a bunch of stuff that I've been... No music. That's sad. Well, let, let's just up that a little bit. Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that I've been working on in, time, in terms of broader design goals for Stonehearth as a whole. I think Stephanie has been alluding to that a bit. And while I'm not quite ready to talk about some of that stuff now, I thought one of the things that might be fun for us to do together is talk through like this idea that I'm spinning on on the side for a new way to approach uh, the class system inside of Stonehearth. I've already written a decent amount of this document, but I thought maybe we could talk through it some, get some feedback, and there's some actually some sticky questions that I'll need to still figure out to move this ball forward a bit more. And who knows where this may end up. We might end up like designing a new formula for damage and armor in the game, which I think we might need to based on where this uh, is going. But let's see. So uh, if you guys have any questions or things, like I like to do design as a dialogue. So I'll be talking um, out loud uh, to myself a whole bunch and please like raise questions or other things. All right. Let's get on this. Close this. Okay. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for my own sanity. Uh, discard my change. Excellent. So, aha, this little thing. In progress design and not very broad consumption. So, I am writing this on the side because I think this direction may end up being like a really cool value add to the game. Just because I'm writing this though doesn't necessarily mean this is the direction that class design in Stonehearth will go. Uh, nor does it mean that we're committed to even doing this type of high level like redesign from the ground up. But I think there's value to be had here in taking a step back and re examining what classes do inside of uh, the game as a whole. So, uh, Bruno Supremo is telling me, remember, call people through those Steam notifications. I don't actually know how to do Steam notifications. So, I'm hoping that maybe Mally, who's on the chat, can figure that out. I've never actually had to do that before. Anyway, let's uh, talk a little bit about what's going on. So, Stonehearth, as you know, it's a game with classes. And those classes, I think, do a lot to help reinforce the fantasy that you're managing a little RPG town. It's a, I think, a really thematic way to uh, separate out um, the different roles and different abilities that the individuals in your town uh, have, and uh, in a way that works with kind of the like nostalgic and uh, you know uh, light fantasy approach. I think I just repeated myself. Anyway, being that that's there, um, this means that by having a clear class definition and the ability for players to move between one role and the next, uh, we can create a system that allows each of these particular classes to have a really distinct character behind them. And ideally, we'll end up with a system that makes the player really excited about getting a new class, unlocking a whole bunch of new abilities, and fundamentally changing the way that their game plays as a result. The current system, as it exists, uh, does a lot of these goals, but the way it's specifically implemented does cause a few problems. So as you can probably see here on the screen, like the one of the things that kind of bothers me about the current approach is the way that the classes are gated structurally. The idea that like to make a cleric, you first have to get a uh, herbalist up to a specific level. And that type of construct can be really cool. In fact, one of my like favorite RPGs, uh, Seiken Densetsu, or uh, 3, Seiken Densetsu 2, also Secret of Mana in the US, um, 
uses this type, actually no, Sekundensetsu, Secret Mon does it, but Sekundensetsu 3 does, sorry. Use this type of thing where you build up character and then you make a branching choice to go in one direction or another. However, in a city manager game, it causes, I think, a... Uh, a few hiccups that don't exist when you're playing as a single character. In particular, when you have that tree structure, it really applies a sense of power progression. So those higher level classes are expressed as inherently better than the previous classes that came before them. And that's not quite what I think that we want for Stoneheart. I think for a town to be like interesting and exciting, you really do want a mixture of all these different types of roles and people inside of your world like working together to build something awesome and uh, reinforcing that okay no you should once you get clerics you should never ever but it's kind of like reduces the importance of clerics as a whole uh reading through chat for a moment so custom sabs to separate custom templates so unethical brits the we're actually in the process right now of rethinking how we do uh, building inside of Stone Earth. If you look at, I believe, a stream that happened two weeks ago with Chris, or at least a, um, a Desktop Tuesday that happened with Chris, we uh, showed off some of the things that we're toying with on uh, the back end. And once we finish exploring that, that will probably then result in a change on the front end for what all of the building UI is. Once we get to that point, I think bringing up the idea of uh, should we create uh, what role should templates have? How do they fit into the game as a whole? And how should, if we uh, continue to pursue them as a core idea, how should players be able to organize them separately, I think is an entirely valid uh, thing to bring up. So when we get to that point, I'll be sure to bring that into the conversation. Uh, uh, Kadalaki, you're asking if we plan to bring rain into the game. Uh, for me personally, I really like weather effects. I think it adds character to the world and creates some interesting gameplay. And also there's some cool things that can happen, especially if you deal with things like, I don't know, um, like making sure that your crops are in uh, wet soil to grow effectively. And then when it rains, you don't have to, your hardlings don't actually have to go through the act of like pulling water over or something else. We're not at the stage yet where like farming requires those types of mechanics, but that's an example of like, oh, you had rain and then you could create a cool like interaction inside the world. So. I would like to do weather. If we do weather, rain is an obvious one. Um, when that comes into the scheme, I think uh, will be a bit before we get there. Ali is actually in the process right now of doing some exploration on, um, some deeper exploration on how the world should look and how the biome should be represented to the game. And so light, darkness, fog, rain, other things, I think those are gonna be part of that conversation as well. Um, so Razor Strike, uh, conversation update came out. Will conversation traits be different from regular traits? Well, so at the moment, we do have some traits that feed directly into the conversation system. As an example, there is the professor trait that when someone has a conversation with the professor, they, uh, the conversation takes a lot longer, but the individual uh, having the conversation with the professor actually gains experience in their particular class. That trait, that professor trait, is a normal trait just like any of the others that you might get inside of the game. And also we've like taken a few traits and modified them into, um, uh, modifying them a little bit so they have hooks into the conversation system without being purely based on the conversation system. So as an example, um, the carnivore trait, which I believe is in the game right now. Um, the hearthling that has carnivore only really wants to eat meat. And uh, one of the things that we talked about doing with the conversation system is like, well, maybe the carnivore should um, always think bad things about, um, about crops. Or as a different example, the um, pet owners when they are talking to someone, always have the option to talk about their pet as one of the subjects that comes up. So those are two examples of things that actually their biggest gameplay effect is on other systems, but they do feed into the conversation system. Um, 
The unethical Brit was asking about the, the magma smith. So the magma smith is something that are that we still want to have. I think it's cool thematically. Uh, what we need to do is, to get that working is one we need to understand what like magma and lava mean inside the game. And so part of the work that Albert's been doing on uh, looking at our water system and fixing some of the issues around liquid flow should allow us to start thinking inside of that space. But beyond that, we also need to figure out like how do, what does it mean to find lava in the world? I mean, if you're in the temperate area we're in right now, probably doesn't make sense to just have a big like lava river on the top surface. So is lava going to be underground? Are we going to have a different biome with volcanoes? Are volcanoes like a natural disaster going to happen? All that stuff is really up in the air. But setting that aside for the moment, Magma Smith is something that I think is thematically really cool. Like you got this uh, high tech, like high magic tech, uh, dangerous crafting job that can create things that other smiths can't do. And we just need to build up a couple of systems along the way there. And I think one of the first things along the way will be uh, improving our economy and our workshop system. Uh, the last stream that I did, I, we actually talked about a redesign for how workshops work in the game. And so as we start building up those steps, I think we'll have a better groundwork to support putting the Magma Smith inside the game, as opposed to simply just plopping it in and adding a couple of new recipes. All right, I think I'm up on questions. So I'll take a drink. Okay, so going back to the class of some stuff, like you've probably read what's on the screen already, so I don't think I'll talk through it. But basically, there's a big opportunity here, and we can do better than what the current system is. So what I'm thinking through right now is an idea that replaces the structure of how classes work. Instead of having a talisman, that the player equips and then they're that class and then when they want to change classes they drop that item and then go pick up the, uh, pick up a different talisman. I'm proposing here more of an idea that you actually like the hearthling gains some sort of special knowledge that allows them to be that class and that knowledge is then now a permanent part of that hearthling. Here I'm calling them knowledge spheres. Frankly that's kind of a bad name. Um, I just conceptually like the idea of like this little like sphere, like golden sphere with a little hoe in it that the hearthling comes over and does the current like ceremony they has. But if you guys have a different idea for a placeholder name I could use here, very welcome to change this. It just works for me. So a hearthling, these spheres then replace what talismans currently do inside of the game in some ways. They are segmented based on their quality level. So like an uh, apprentice knowledge sphere, a journeyman knowledge sphere, or a master knowledge sphere. And a hearthling can consume one of these spheres, use them, celebrate them, whatever ends up, the metaphor ends up being, to then permanently learn how to become that class. Once they've used that sphere, no one else can use that sphere. It's now a, per it's now a permanent part of them. And this specific aspect of it, of the sphere being consumed to teach the hearthling um, the class, I think is an important change uh, that could bring a lot to the table. In part, that means that um, we can create more ceremony and interest around finding one of these things. Um, we can do things where actually getting like a journeyman uh, crafter or a master crafter is an important thing. And interestingly, we can also start to do things like having crafting recipes specifically to make these, um, uh, these spheres as well in a more meaningful way, especially if these are rare in of themselves. Uh, Anathil Britt, you're asking about multiplayer. So um, we are talking about multiplayer actively right now. Um, I don't have um, anything to show you or announce or anything like that, but it is like an active part of conversation around the team at the moment. I can tell you from a design side that if we are to pursue multiplayer, I'm very interested in exploring a single world multiplayer where two, pl two or more players play a game inside of the same map using the same time speed and like building either right next to each other or 
separated inside of the world as a whole. It's not something that's done commonly in this genre. In fact, if you look into it, you'll really only see examples like SimCity 2000 Network Edition and like Dungeon Keeper 2. Examples of this are like old and spotty and uh, at least the ones that have the most relevance to our genre specifically because frankly it's really hard. But just because it's hard and hasn't been done doesn't mean that there isn't an opportunity here. So yeah, if we pursue multiplayer, I think that's what um, the type of gameplay we want to pursue. S same map, synchronous speed, uh, you and someone else working uh, cooperatively together to uh, build that forward. Uh, ferocity. So yeah, Stone Hearth is now... Uh, Stone Hearth was originally founded... Uh, was original project of a studio called Radiant, uh, which ran the original Kickstarter um, about a little over a year ago now. Um, Radiant was actually purchased by Riot Games. So um, we up here in the Bay actually work for Riot Games as a whole, um, still doing Stone Hearth. And one of the cool things about that is that it has allowed the team to start pulling in a bunch of new resources. Like for example, I joined the team um, a year ago and part of the reason I joined was actually because I worked for Riot Games for five years before leaving to work on Dauntless. So the idea of like, oh, I can come back and work for a really cool studio like Riot Games, but also work on this really neat project in a different city that, frankly, I like a bit more than LA, um, was one of the things that drew me in. And there are a bunch of people uh, who have recently joined our team who follow a similar model. Either they came through us through Riot Games directly um, and had interest in Stonehearth or heard about Stonehearth because, you know, they were originally looking at Riot Games. They're like, oh, what's this cool project? So yeah, um, we we work for Riot Games. It's a great uh, relationship and I'm super happy to have the opportunity to work on Stonehearth. Um, and yeah, nothing cool, it's Dungeon Keeper 2 and Stonehearth are surprisingly close together in a lot of ways. Um, I still very much remember running around in uh, first person mode and the like little flying bugs um, like all the time inside of that game. I love Dungeon Keeper 2. Okay, so. If we make these spheres special things then uh, and rare things that are consumed it gives us an opportunity to create more ceremony around finding them uh them in quest rewards in fi finding them inside the world rare drops or like cool things that you can purchase from a trader the in speaking to that specifically for raya's children right now um you know, when I when I play Rise Children, I keep looking at the trader, hoping that they bring in like you know my first footman or some other class that's fairly difficult for me to make. That idea of being excited to see a new class and be like, oh man, I can make this now, is one of the things that I think uh, a change to the system will help us capture every time it moves forward. Because imagine that you didn't yourself have the capability to easily make like new footman spheres, you had to buy them or find them, then when traders came in or you found the cross rewards, you'd still get that same level of excitement, at least for a longer amount of time than you do with the talisman approach that exists right now. Um. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's that's actually pretty cute uh, on Ethical Brit. Um, I'm not sure that we can go with the like SNM torture chamber that Dungeon Keeper 2 had as the way that you convert downed enemies into your soldiers. Um, I definitely don't think I can get uh, those um, dominatrixes into Stonehearth, but yeah, I that is a that's a fond memory of Dungeon Keeper 2. Okay, um, and so for the classes, I think there are a couple things that we still need to do. So the change, when you change it to a new class, there needs to be a ceremony around it so you can't like flip classes while you're in the middle of combat. And one of the things that I'd like to also do is expand the um, skill system associated with classes to potentially add like a small amount of binary choice with it so that there is the ability for you to specialize a particular class, a particular hearthling in one particular way. And it also, I think, creates some neat excitement about getting to that second or third or fourth level 
that the current system doesn't strongly provide. I'm not super sure on this particular uh, pathway yet. I need to think it, think about it some more, but I wanted to share it here um, just to let you know that it might be an interesting way to think down. Okay. So, let's kind of a walk through of where this document is at. Let me talk through what some of the things I am not sure on are. So, I'm kind of imagining, let me, let me do a terrible MS Paint because that's a good idea. So, I'm kind of imagining like when you go to a, a Hearthling character page, like you would see something that looks kind of like this. So we got a, um, here, let's do a, uh, what am I doing? What am I doing? Let's draw a sword. Swords are good. Everybody likes swords. Um, bloop, 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 bloop. That's a sword, trust me. Yes, I am not an artist. If you came to see an artist draw things, you came to the wrong stream. Um, so a character page might look up something like this. I'm going to get really OCD in a moment because I'm terrible at drawing. So we'd have, if you go to your character page, let's see, like little things for each of the classes. I just realized that me drawing the sword actually makes this worse. Um, I'm just gonna, just gonna fix this real fast. Da, 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 da. And so I'll just draw like fake icons for all this stuff. We here's a class icon. Uh, here is a class icon. Uh, here is a class icon. Here is a class icon. And then uh, here is a class icon. Um, so you kind of go to your character page, and you see like each of the different classes that uh, the Hearthling has. And then as you're building up the spheres, you might see something like, uh, oh, like this guy has these two and this one and like this one. So he could switch to any of these particular classes. Um, and then maybe at a particular point, his current class is like, has a little outline around it like that. I'm not a UX designer, but this starts to help me think about things. So a question that I haven't figured out is, so you can see here, like, okay, I've got, I can be a journeyman, footman, I can click around, I can't beat these guys yet, maybe these don't even show up if I can't make them. Um, is this question, um, so if a hearthling hasn't consumed a knowledge sphere tied to a class, they can't become the class. That makes sense. But a hearthling is not required to consume a lower quality sphere before they consume a higher quality one. So what I mean by this is that if you if you had if you found in the wilderness a master cleric like knowledge sphere, meaning that you could turn one of your uh, people in your town and give them the knowledge to be the best cleric they could possibly be. Can you just give that sphere to anyone? Or does the hearthling who uh, consumes it, do they need to have also consumed like the apprentice and the journeyman uh, knowledge sphere? So that's one of the things that I'm torn about with this approach, in part because I, 
I want you to always be excited when you find one of these things. And if we set it up so that you have to have these prereqs before you can consume with a like master one or the journeyman one, then there's a risk that you'll get one of these things and be super excited about the concept that now you can make one of these guys. But you wouldn't actually be able to make it inside of the game. And that feels a little like, eh, it's not like a great moment when that happens in a game. It's, you know, you find this the super legendary, like, ultra weapon, but it's eight levels above what your current character is at. So you're like, okay, well, I guess I'll store this in a box and think about it again in a couple of levels. Um, on the flip side, though, like thematically, just taking anyone and being like, oh, hey, you are now, you didn't know anything about uh, crafting stuff before? Well, now you are a master craftsman. Like thematically, that seems a bit disjoint. Um, maybe it's okay because as I'm thinking through these, these spheres are unlock the ability to get to that level as opposed to actually making you that level. But that's one of the threads I haven't like quite worked out for myself yet. Um, Unethical Brit. So, any over, sort of over top fantasy classes? Um, I don't know. I don't think I count that out. I kind of like the idea of adding like a fire mage or an ice mage or a like a hero uh, character class. Um, when we get to the point of like redoing the class system, I think that's when we'll start carving out some of those things. Of course, it's really easy to jump towards. Um, uh, combat oriented like over the top classes but if we can think of some like the magma smith or like the geomancer that feed potentially back into construction as well I think there's a real opportunity for that um, speaking of mods any info about steam workshop um, nothing I can share here unfortunately uh, knowledge fears yes I am I apologies for putting the MS paint in front of everyone um, da, 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 da. Make a show, but that's interesting. Um, hmm. So set it up so that we the spheres give you a certain like access, like number of access levels, but you could like consume other ones. Um, hmm. So, thinking through that, that works in some ways, but I think what that system implies is that you, you could get to like master level by just consuming a bunch of the uh, novice spheres. And I don't think I like that conceptually just because it's like walking up and then like reading a bunch of novice books. Um, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't thematically like work for me in the sense of like, oh, you like just by reading, by eating a bunch of these like really basic spheres, you're now super powerful. It's kind of like um, in Skyrim, you know, building like a hundred iron daggers, and then the next thing you build is your legendary Deadric armor set because a hundred daggers gave you all the technical skill you needed. Um, there's a way to fix that if, like the the spheres gave like the if somehow you made the progress not linear, so it's not just like oh the sphere gives you like two and this one gives you five and this one gives you eight but more like it's a exponential curve but I think that just exacerbates the problem because now instead of potentially of getting to like master capability by eating like four of these spheres example with the numbers that you gave you can get to master level by eating like 25 of them um, I think at that point it starts causing you to care less about each of these individual items which is where I kind of want the system to go we're finding any of these things is always interesting for some perspective um, 
So I don't, I don't, it's interesting, but I think as I think through it, it doesn't quite work, work out. Um, okay. So do I like this? I think this still makes sense. I think the reasoning of I want you always to be excited about finding something is the right approach. I could level gate it. No, that's the same problem, it's just a different form of it. Um, I could Maybe the problem that I'm worried about isn't actually there if finding and or making these things is rare and hard to do. In that case, yeah, I guess absent other considerations, I will I'll err on the side of benefiting the player, and the be most beneficial thing to the player is I found something cool, I want to use it immediately. So, okay. All right, so I'll leave it as that for the moment. So, another thing that I am not sure about, oh, let me, hold on, I'm gonna, gonna copy this bad MS Paint in. So one of the other things that there might be an opportunity for here, and at this point I'm really just brainstorming, so um, any ideas uh, or resonance that you guys might have with this would be interesting. So um, I wonder if, before I go down that, um, oh, uh, unethical Brit. If this isn't clear here, let me uh, uh, let me try and rephrase it. At the moment, what I'm thinking of is that these spheres affect your level cap. They don't actually affect your level, and maybe that disconnect is bad. Um, I, but I think there's a possible value in separating that concept. Um, it doesn't sit super well with me, but I kind of like the idea of like, okay, even if we gave you like your gold level master sphere, so you have the potential to make, like become a master now, you actually need to go through the process of making some things to get your skill up to do that. That disconnect, I don't know. Now that I say it, but I don't want to discard the idea of experience either. Hmm. Is it recipes? No, I don't think it's recipes. By that, like, these things give you a bucket load of recipes, and so what you have these controls, what types of things you can make. There's a potentially interesting thing there. Yeah, Kenny, it's kind of like um, the theory there is that, like, well, without having like this particular thing, there's no way you could make this awesome stuff. For instance, no matter how good you are at um, at making chainmail, it doesn't really tell you anything about the types of techniques that you need to make 
like plate mail, someone has to like actually walk you through because they're like very different forging processes as an example. Or like, you know, the difference between blowing glass versus molding glass. Yeah, it's still the same like base concept, but the techniques are so different you have to learn how to do that. So did I lose myself? I think I did lose myself there. Um, yeah, it does feel strange though. The analog would be like licenses, but licenses obviously make no sense in the context of Stoneheart. There's not some like magical judge going around saying, you cannot make plate mail until you have a gold star. But yeah. Um, Could we divorce the two? So one thing we could do, I don't know, so this is going into a different direction, but give me a moment. Um, what if, yeah, I don't think this will work, but I'll still finish the idea. Um, what if the orbs don't actually relate to like level? So it's not two, four, six, it's not that. Um, but instead it's something more like, uh, like you're getting different features of the class. So um, the footman might be an easy example of this. And combat, unfortunately, will be easier to do in a lot of the times where it's like, OK, um, the first sphere is your like, um, the first sphere is your like health. That's a terrible cross. Are your healing skills? The second sphere is the stuff that teaches you how to be a good, like, shieldy dude. That's a shield, trust me. Um, and the third one is the one that gives you um, all your, like, spin to win attacks. Um, so it's like, in this model, it's not as much about. Um, like the this guy is a master sphere and this guy is a apprentice sphere. Instead, what it is is that these are all kind of like equivalents, maybe. And so maybe you do like a I don't know. I'm just gonna draw things like a red. Oh, I need to. I'm even bad at MS Paint. Wow. Um, so you do kind of like a red, like color code the thing. So you've got a red, blue, and green spheres. And then you can like take these and slot them in. So this guy has like, I'm just going to recolor these for a moment. So this guy has like the red and blue sphere of this class, but is missing the green sphere. And so if it was a crafting class, maybe it'd be like things like um, you can make fine items uh, of this class or um, the skills that let you do um, heavy armor as opposed to normal armor or... Um, yeah. So, I'm 
this could work. Catching up with chat. Hold on. Yeah, so make a show of the study versus experience was the thematic that I was thinking of originally. Like, okay, this gives you like the knowledge to become a master, but it doesn't give you the like the core techniques um, of being a master. You have to level get that out through your um, through your own experience. I kind of like, I kind of, well, this is fundamentally different than where I wrote the document, but let me think through this. So um, in this proposal, I am not actually saying that you could spec someone with all red, all blue, and all green. What I'm saying is that um, each particular class has a, like, red, blue, and, oops, has a red, blue, and green, like, knowledge sphere with them. And so then the, like, a master is simply represented by, um, like, having all of these filled. If you have all of these thrilled, then you know all of the special skills associated with class. Um, I think, sorry, my brain's like going 30, 40 miles an hour. Um, so if we did this, the questions that start to rise up would be one, should the uh, these spheres that are like, we're trying to segment down so there's like, you know, three different types of them. One, should they be specific to the class, i.e. should you find a um, uh, like the footman blue and the footman red and the footman green, or should you find the uh, versus like having like red, blue, and green that you can then say, oh, I'll put the red one in this footman here, and I'll, oh, I have another red one, well, I'll put it in, you know, the craftsman. Um, the more specific we make the things, the more I think finding any particular thing becomes a celebration, but there's a little bit, like, I kind of like the flexibility of you found this stuff. But then if we did the flexible approach, that defeats one of the purposes of this redesign, which is to provide an interesting way of gating access to certain classes. Because then what would stop you from taking like your generic red sphere and putting it into like your, your footman class that you don't have yet, or your cleric class that you don't have yet. If we did that, we would need to limit access to the classes via some other mechanism. Catch up with chat. Um, uh, Coaster Paul, yeah, we could have the knowledge spheres increase the level cap and give a small XP buff. Uh, there'd be no harm in that, regardless of what it is. And yeah, giving a ma giving a um, uh, like a master sphere, being like, oh, you consume master sphere. Okay, well now you're just like a level one or two. Um, crafter anyway, like nothing conceptually wrong with that. Um, yeah, so how RNG would it be if they were unique to each class? Um, well, so I think what we would probably do there, Andrea, is one of the things that I'm hoping to move forward with is actually creating like a stronger thread or arc to the experience as a whole. And part of the way to do that is, is to create better mechanisms for gating particular content. So as an example, um, maybe in the current structure that Stoneheart has, imagine that like it's not even possible for you to find um, or acquire 
cleric spheres until you get to a level two town or it's not even possible for you to or the the first time you can ever find um, an engineer uh, sphere would be when you raid a goblin camp and end up kicking them out of the map and then once you do that that opens up some options for you otherwise um, so I think we could tune that and I think we can do if we want to get really clever we can do things like oh imagine that there are like I'm just going to brainstorm ideas that will probably get me in trouble later um, like oh there are factions inside of Stonehearth and you can like gain allegiance with them and ultimately one of the things you could do is you could request traders from particular from different like faction civilizations and when those traders come they carry with them the knowledge of their civilization which includes like certain classes that they specialize in and that's maybe a way that you get access to some of these classes but hey if you align with the with the like the the northern kingdom uh good luck ever getting a fire mage because that's knowledge that like rise children has it's really tough to manage that as an example, um, don't know if we'll ever get to or want to pursue factional things, but that's a case of like, okay, you can gate it and then um, prevent access to higher level things and not make just it be a big grab bag of like, oh, I walked into the woods. Oh, this time I found a, um, a gold cleric, but this other time I found a, a gold engineer just by pure chance. Combat equipment. Yes. Um, I think combat equipment wise, I lean towards actually not putting level requirements and stuff. I think um, to reinforce the crafting concept, we may want to um, instead go down a route where if you're able to make something awesome, then let's put the focus on getting the materials to make the awesome thing and then making the awesome thing well. Not so much on then making sure that the the dude who's using it like it's super good at using it we could do that we could say like oh to get to wear like the the reflective golden plate mail your footman has to be a master footman um or in this alternative like i'm just gonna minimize this um colored sphere model they need to have like the green slot we could do that and we may need to do that but there might be a more elegant way of doing that. As an example, um, I was talking about like binary skill choice in as you level up the hard things. Maybe you could do something where like one of these choices for the footman, like footmen, unlike knights, uh, footmen wear medium armor and knights wear heavy armor. And one of the choices that you can make at your in as you're going through it is like, oh, well, do you want your footman to either wear to be able to wield? two-handed weapons or should they be able to wield heavy armor and so like into if you make that choice that's how you can make this footman like wear the super awesome like armor maybe and maybe it's a similar thing like you spec in magic armor versus something else and so it's kind of then tied to level but in a more like directed way as opposed to just pure experience um hmm Uh, Mega Show. Um, why not tie the use of spheres to specific hearthlings instead to the class globally? So you're like lo you're like researching the uh, the class as a whole, if I'm understanding it. Um, we could do that. It reduces the opportunity of excitement around these things because um, there's just fewer opportunities to find to have them in the world, right? Like. In this particular, in this approach where they're tied to a particular Hearthling, um, you have 15 classes, um, you have three levels per class, like potential Hearthling, like alone could consume 45 of these things, and then you multiply that by the number of Hearthlings you have in your town, 20 or something, right? And then, like, as you continue to get these, they're still potentially useful to you. If you do it to class as a, to the, like, map as a whole, then you're just ever at that 25 about. And... I still don't think that's necessarily solved one of the things of how sorry I'm jumping ahead of myself um, if you do it on the level as a whole there is value there 
specifically related to unlocking certain capabilities. And I think there is an alternative pathway we could pursue around like a heavy, like creating a research task or a like a town resource that you spend to unlock certain classes. And conversely, maybe you, you spend that town resource to unlock the class for the town as a whole. And then like you could also condense those resources down to be these like little spheres maybe, or maybe one or the other. Um, but if we put the upgrades of the class as a whole, then if this is also the mechanism that we're using to restrict access to a particular class, we'll end up in a space where players will be able to easily transition uh, characters to classes that they haven't actually ever thought about that character being a class before, i.e. is like, oh, I unlocked I unlock clerics. Cool, I unlock master clerics. Great. Um, I'm now going to immediately promote eight of my hearthlings to master clerics, and we're just going to run around having a cleric party, uh, proselytizing everyone. Um, that doesn't feel right. Uh, I kind of prefer more the... I prefer the more like Final Fantasy Tactics analog, where the individual hearthling, like you invest time and resources into them, and as a result, that particular hearthling now has new capabilities. There's still like some connection that works there between the town and the individual, but I like more the focus being on the individual as opposed to the town. Sorry, that was a long way about to answer your question, um, but this is tricky stuff. Um, so there we go. Yes, Kilkenny, I like the idea of specking warriors towards like particular preferred weapons. Like you can imagine, again, warrior tree. It's like, oh, do you want to like choose that this warrior is super good with mauls or super good with swords? Great, you've made that choice. Now he's going to, like, that's what that guy's going to do. Um, I find that much more interesting. Uh, as a whole, as opposed to item level type things. Wanting more hours of gameplay for everybody, uh, clanning. Um, what I want is I want Stonehearth to have a stronger arc of experience from beginning to end. And one of the things that I think Stonehearth needs to be successful at that are continual micro goals or improvements that you can make along the way to feel like there's always one more thing you can do. Changing the class system to have more of these like milestone based upgrades that are small, consumable, and make noticeable progress forward while unlocking new stuff is something that um, starts building towards that goal, but we need a lot of systems to start building in that direction to like, get that overall experience. Like ideally, Stonehearth is a game that you play, you play it for 30 minutes, and you're like, oh man, if I just played for 10 more minutes, I could do this awesome thing. And then you play for those 10 more minutes, and as a result, you've now unlocked like something else that you could do. You're like, oh man, just 10 more minutes, and now I can do this other really cool thing too. And then you get trapped in this loop where now like 48 hours have passed, and you're super hungry and you're like, why I can barely keep my eyes open because you just want to play Stonehearth all the time forever. Uh, Stonehearth is Skynet. Um, that doesn't even make sense, but all right, whatever. I, I am I'm going on full steam here. So um, yes, I want Stonehearth to have a better arc of experience. Um, da -da -da -da. Make a show. Yeah, so one of the things that you're talking about right now of like restricting access to certain parts of the map, uh, I think that's really cool. Um, I think there is a big opportunity to do more with uh, exploration and with making the world more dynamic as a whole. So yeah, I think um, hiding these inside the world, requiring you to figure out what to do with those bunny statues um, to get these things like waiting, getting access to them as a result of these narrative events that are happening with goblins coming or the uh, orcs or whatever that ends up being. Um, yeah, I think that is really cool. Um, let's see, catching up chat. Da, 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 da. Uh, Kilkenny, yeah, I like 
uh, when I play Morrowind, I go immediately up to Red Mountain and steal all the glass armor. Um, and it kind of trivializes the entire game for me, but knowing I feel cool knowing that I can do that. Um, uh, An Uncle Britt, yes, I think that we need a way for combat classes to gain experience outside of um, outside of combat. And I think that uh, training dummies, uh, giving experience while you're patrolling, or other things along those vein are um, definitely things that we should do. I completely agree with that. Um, okay. So, you guys have got me thinking down an interesting direction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stare at my beautiful MS Paint art as I ponder colored spheres. Which will mean nothing to anyone that hasn't watched the whole stream. But um, you guys, you guys know what's going on. Um, that's interesting. This is really intriguing to me. Because one thing I like about this is it's kind of like you're, like you're putting the pieces together of the class, and then once you've gotten all of them, you've like completed the class, and that's that's a cool hook that the just the the direction I was proposing doesn't have. So this would be, if we were to continue this line of thought, then you'd probably want these things to be orthogonal to leveling up your character. I.e., like you still have your experience level on a class, you can get more experience. And that's great, and experience kind of affects more like dumb stats, like crafting speed or um, uh, you know, base HP, like those kind of like things that give a sense of progression, but like aren't really sexy in itself. But then you put all the like really juicy bits into this. So this is where you get your like special skills. This is where you gain the ability to like. And those skills give you the ability to like change how the class fundamentally works. This is really interesting. This is really interesting. All right, let me see. Um, So, Mega Shub. Uh, yes, I think that works. That's not too distinct from even like the basic idea that I was proposing of like, oh, you got your apprentice, journeyman, and master spheres, and one could even imagine that these blue, red, green stuff are your like journeyman skills, your apprentice spheres skills, and your master skills. I kind of like the like equivalency balance that happens, but one could easily conceptualize that. Like, some stuff just doesn't start showing up until later in the game. Uh, unethical Brit. Uh, harder enemy classes. Yeah, uh, it is too easily to trivialize too much of the content combat-wise inside of the game. So I am super interested in the idea of uh, fiddling with that. I would love to pull some ideas from, like, 
Warhammer as an example where you can have your ogres pick up goblins and then throw them and they could do that to like get over walls or moats that you've made and like I think sappers are like a super cool idea like oh no you, you got this big like giant wall around you well they're just gonna like blow it up or like tunneling tunneling moles or ants that uh, come up from the grounds and like start harassing you EDF style I don't know um yeah I think that uh, more variation in what our monsters do would be great. I think the balance that we need to strike is we, I don't think we want this game to turn into like a pure combat driven game. So like, I don't think that um, if this game becomes entirely about build your town so it's strong enough to defend against these things, I think we're a little bit missing the vector um, that we should be going down. Like we don't as much want like stronghold as we want um, is it Kingsfield? Man, I haven't played that game in that was like a '95 PlayStation RPG. Was it even PlayStation? Jeez. I'm having I'm having vague memories of having to build farms and then going off on adventures. Uh, I don't even know if it's that game. Uh, yeah, Goblin Ladders. I think I think giving monsters the ability to build ladders would be cool. Though if I um, uh, if I built ladders into the game in an aggressive style, I'd really want the like halflings to be able to defend against that by like pushing the letters down. It doesn't really work inside of our tech because we do things like voxel by voxel. We could fix that and make cool like slanted ladders. But honestly, I think it's just kind of funnier if you've got your trolls, they pick up a goblin and then they throw them over the wall. Um, I think that's more flavorful and funny as a whole, especially if they're throwing sappers, right? You throw the sappers over the wall and then the sappers go up and blow up the defenses from the inside. Um, and one of the cool things about the work that Chris is doing is, on the building restructure is, what well, we haven't been able to like commit to destruction or other things, like that pathway gives us the ability to start thinking about like partial construction and partial destruction of spaces, which is something that we we frankly can't even have a really good conversation about with the current building system. Uh, okay, you guys have given me some good food for thought. And see, this is what kind of happens when you're working on a design document. Sometimes you've got all this, this pretty sentences with great MS Paint art and then someone's like what about the color red and you're like well poop I didn't think about the color red and then you wonder if you should redesign the whole thing hmm all right I'm gonna let me just put the little thing here This is either, when someone looks at this page, they'll either think that this is a really clever, like, design, or they'll think it's a hidden map to some mystical treasure. Um, or they'll think it's a scrawling, the scrawlings of a two-year-old. One of those three. Um, one of those three. Okay. Um, it's totally materia. Well, no, no, if it was materia, you'd need to do, like, Meat, and then you do a little meat, and then you do like a little. Gotta get, gotta get that link material going, right? Like that. Yeah. 
Make materia. That's materia. Although I guess it was kind of a teal, wasn't it? It was like, ooh. Uh, yeah, Nothical Brit, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, spheres are a thing that is easy for me to conceptualize, but isn't, like, it's not super thematic. Um, so, yeah, books will probably work better. Books will probably work a lot better. I don't know why I didn't start with books. But that's what happens. Uh, so it probably will be books by the end. Um, I think what it was is there was a Final Fantasy RPG called Crystal Chronicles uh, that, one, I strongly disliked and is, in fact, one of only three games I've ever sold back to GameStop. But it had the idea of, like, the memories inside the world were, like, People had lost a bunch of their memories, and the memories had condensed down into like little spheres that had the memories inside of them. Um, a la uh, Never Ending Story 2. Wow. Um, but you find these, and you could use them, and yeah, stuff would happen. Uh, Celestra CC is, um, is also for the people that don't have to carry the bucket. If you, if you want to carry the bucket, then you are welcome to carry the bucket. That was my entire experience playing um, playing that game. So, all right. Well, we're actually about 11 minutes past where the stream is supposed to end. But um, what I guess I'm actually having a super fun time with this. I hope you guys are enjoying this. Uh, I'll be happy to stick around for a few more questions. But then I think my wife will um, probably glare at me um, more and more the longer I stay on the chat. Fortunately, she's not in the stream, so she can't uh, actively harass me to get home. So if you guys have any questions or other random things you want to talk about um, with just this dude on the internet, I am happy to stick around um, for a little bit longer. It also gives me an excuse to keep pondering this. Um, hmm. One thing I need to figure out for the next time if I stream, the next time I stream, not if, the next time I stream, is I really love to use some, play some music from other games in the background. I don't know what the legality of that is, but I really love to do that. Um... Yeah, I, it's not in, you know what, here. There you go, resolved. Good point. Uh, it is on my local desktop. It's just not on this one for some reason. Hmm. Also, stone harsh should probably be in the dictionary. Let's fix that too. I'll save this. Uh, DDR0, you um, keep in mind that while I'm doing the stream, I am representing Riot Games, which is a much different uh, legal entity than just me as an independent developer. If I was just like streaming my work at home, uh, I would like be playing near music all day, every day, 100% of the time. I don't know if I can do that on one of our streams. Maybe Clanning's right. Maybe if it's not monetized, but that's on YouTube. Um, don't know what it is on Twitch. Anyway, I will research that because I would love to put music on in the background of the games I'm actively playing, um, and I will figure that out. Uh, and that got me with one last question before I take off. Um, yes, Unethical Brit, that is easily fixed. 
um, with some uh, some tuning. That is just a probably a product of the fact that the archers are doing a like move to unit that is at the um, with a distance radius that is the same distance radius as their range of attack, which is a, a common mistake to make. What you actually want to do is you want to do your like move to radius so that they move to a point that's actually slightly inside of their range of attack. This is scripting stuff. Um, and that way, once they're there and they start attacking, if the enemy moves away, you can keep attacking. Or conversely, like if you start an attack that's in range, like allow them to finish it even if the target gets out range afterwards. That's what we do on like League of Legends. And it can lead to some funny stuff where like if you throw a fireball at someone immediately as they're uh, recalling back to base, um, that fireball will then like travel the entire length of the map to get them at their base. Um, or at least it did for a long time. I think they added disjointing to blue pills. But, but yeah. Um, okay. Well, I am going to close this down. Thank you guys for being part of this. Um, design streams always can end up in really random directions, but I think we came up with some really interesting stuff that I'm going to need to digest. Uh, expose you to this idea again. No idea if this is where the system will uh, get to, but it is a direction that I'm thinking down right now. And yeah, thanks for participating, guys. And I forget who's on the stream for next week, but uh, check back. Same, same time. All right. You guys have a good night. I will talk to you later. Or good morning to you the, for those of you on the other side of the world.